Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar. This is our third webinar in the Dementia Care Aware series. We're really glad you could join us. We know it's a Friday and uh, a lunchtime session, so we really appreciate you coming to learn a little bit more about Dementia Care Aware and particularly about our topic today, which is conducting the cognitive health assessment with an interprofessional team. Um, as I already mentioned, I'm Anna Chodos. I'm going to moderate the session, and we're very fortunate to have a co-presenter today, Dr. Catherine Day Azambuja uh, from University of California, Irvine. Let's go to the next slide. Neither of us have any financial disclosures to report. Next slide, please. And just a little bit more about the two of us. So I'm over here in University of California, San Francisco, and I practice medicine in our community clinics in this affiliated with San Francisco General Hospital, where I do geriatrics. And I'm very fortunate to be the executive director of Dementia Care Aware. We are thrilled that we could have a presenter today who knows a lot about interprofessional team collaboration, Dr. Catherine De Azambuja from University of California at Irvine. And Dr. De Azambuja practices both geriatrics primary care and full scope family medicine in a federally qualified health center. So we're just overjoyed that she could be with us today for this statewide presentation and a brief orientation to our presentation today. Pretty soon I'm gonna hand it off to her to tell you about how we envision being able to adapt the cognitive health assessment to primary care and team-based care. But um, we will do our very best to keep time for questions at the end. So feel free to put your questions in the Q&A in the chat throughout. I will do my best to monitor them and get to them as we're going along. But we are really going to try to also leave some open time at the end for questions. But we will end right at one, just to be respectful of your time. Go ahead and advance the slides. And I wanted to provide just a general reminder that on our website right now, our main training is live and available. It's at DementiaCareWare.org. This training is sort of the cornerstone of the work that we're doing. It's all about the cognitive health assessment, essentially how you can do a very brief annual assessment of your patients. Uh, really, this is geared towards those who are Medi-Cal recipients and 65 and older, but it really mm -hmm. could be used in all patients. And so that's why we wanna really bring some general examples to you today. The training is for any team member and it provides lots of opportunities for continuing education credits including CME and MOC credits and other, um, other professions as well can get credit there and the information is there on the course. So we really hope you'll take a look at that as well as learning today on how to adapt some of those elements to primary care and the team-based approach. All right, well, I would, I'm glad to be able to um, ask Kat to go ahead and present our topic for today, and I'll be monitoring the chat and questions as we go along. Thank you so much, Kat, for um, presenting to our learners today. No, thank you so much, Dr. Chodos, and uh, thank you to the UCSF uh, Dementia Care Aware team for inviting me to present on this webinar today. Um, so I'll go over today's learning objectives. Um, the, the objectives will be describing the roles different interprofessional team members can play in doing the cognitive health assessment, and also review case examples of a team approach to the cognitive health assessment. So I, I wanted to get to start off with some uh, more common barriers to detecting cognitive impairment in the primary care setting. Like Dr. Chodos mentioned, I do practice family medicine at the federally qualified health center. So I do see a lot of patients in that setting and I myself come across these barriers um, being one of the more important ones being time limitations. I know as a family practitioner, we're very stretched with time. We have so much to do in very little time. So that's probably one of the more, um, the more common barriers to performing these cognitive health assessments. There's also the perceived lack of support. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, the perception that you might feel like you don't have enough of the specialty resources to, to 
perform the cognitive health assessment or to refer once you have identified cognitive health assessment, what do you, what are the next steps? Um, and the third point is staffing being a challenge. I know that primary care clinics come in different shapes and forms. There's different um, structures out there. So not everyone has the same uh, same type of staffing available to them. And so that's, I know it's a big barrier to be able to perform these kind of health assessments. So I wanted to review a little bit um, the cognitive health assessment, which is presented in the training module on the Dementia Care Aware uh, website. Um, it is um, a, an assessment tool, that a module for training that is designed for primary care teams. Um, and that includes physicians and other team members that can play a part in um, helping the different steps of the cognitive health assessment. So it does allow different team members within the clinic to help administer the different parts of the health assessment and, and together work in a team uh, team approach to come up with, with um, the, the patient's, um, at least determine if the patient has cognitive impairment or not. Um, it can be done on different days. So just a summary in terms of the, the cognitive health assessment steps, which I'll be referring to as CHA steps. Um, the steps are here summarized so that they include taking the patient's history, um, using the tools to assess for cognitive and functional decline, and establishing and documenting a patient's support person or and or healthcare agent. So these steps um, are the components of the CHA, but they don't have to be done on the same day. Um, and they can be done by different team members. So you can really work in a, in a collaborative way and, and collect all this information and come up with your assessments. So um, it's really important to, to think about different ways that you can use the team that you have at your disposal or, or the, the team members that you work with on a daily basis and see how they can help you um, collect the different parts of the CHA and come up with, with a final assessment. So it's really important to think of trying to utilize your team and getting them trained as well. So in the next um, in the next few slides, I will be going over a little bit later um, different case scenarios and, and thinking of different ways that you can integrate your team members, your interprofessional team members, to help collect the different information from your patient and come together to um, to make the final assessment. So um, I know that, like I mentioned, primary care uh, clinics come in different in different varieties. There's different um, team member structures. So I just wanted to point out a few examples. Um, some clinics have doctors um, and other clinicians who provide direct patient care, including physician assistants, nurse practitioners. And then you have your support staff, like your medical assistants, your nursing staff. Um, some teams just have um, clinicians and maybe the medical assistants and a social worker. Um, other clinics have physicians, medical assistant, maybe a care na navigator or health coach to kind of help more connecting patients with resources in the community. So um, since I work at a fed federally qualified health center, I just wanted to point out the way our structure works. We have primary care providers, which are our doctors, our nurse practitioners, again, providing the direct patient care. And then we have our support staff, including our nurses, our medical assistants. We have a pharmacy team that helps review medications for our patients. So they actually, we actually have a pharmacy clinic, which is wonderful for our patients. Uh, we have licensed clinical social workers who provide um, care for, provide resources for our patients. They also provide mental health um, care. And we have our front desk staff and we have a group medical visit staff. So we actually have patients come in for um, these group medical visits where we talk about topics in a group setting, such as diabetes education, advanced care planning discussions. So this is just an example of, of a type of, of primary care setting. So with that, I kind of wanted to go over my example of my primary care setting and how we, um, we engage our different team members in in collecting different parts of the cognitive health assessment. So like I mentioned, we have our front desk. So when our patients come in and register for their, or sign up for their appointment, we have these standardized uh, patient um, 
forms that they can fill out while they're while they're waiting to be room. So they're not even the, in the room yet. So while they're in the waiting room, we have, for example, a questionnaire um, asking about function, about their ADLs and their IADLs. So they can uh, go over that while they're while they're waiting. Um, our MAs are trained to perform the GP cog or the mini cog while they're rooming the patient. So, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Those tests can take a few minutes. So in, in the time that they're speaking with the patient, they can actually do the mini cog and the GP cog. So that part of the, again, the CHA has been taken care of during, during those few minutes, which is great. Um, we also have RNs who help call patients after the appointments to follow up on brain health plan, which we'll go over a little bit later and go over resources. Um, so I actually have a, an RN that works with me, with my patients closely, and she actually follows up with the patients I've given advanced care, advanced health care directives to, and she follows up and to see if they've completed it and if they have any questions or any concerns, or if they have to come back and maybe speak with me a little bit more. So she helps me with that. So again, this is an example of how my team at the Federal Qualified Health Center, um, how, they, how we work together to collect the different elements of the CHA, and then together we're able to come up with an assessment for that, for that patient. So I'm gonna go up, now break it down to each step of the CHA, starting with the taking the history and provide some examples. So again, this can be done in different ways and by different clinic, clinic members. It does not have to always be the clinician. It can be anyone who comes in contact with the patient. Um, so some examples, um, starting with the front desk staff. Um, the front desk staff, a lot of times they get they get really familiar with our patients. You know, they they form relationships, they, they, they talk a lot. So a lot of my front desk really know my patients pretty well. Um, and they they often can can notice the first signs of something going on cognitively, um, things like uh, missing appointments. So a front desk staff worker who knows a patient really well can take note that maybe that person's no longer making their appointments like they used to and, and kind of flag that as something's going on. Um, or if someone comes into the clinic um, to sign for their sign up for their appointment, and they seem confused, which is not normal for them. So just with that observation, the front desk can alert the, the back office and let us know that something's going on and maybe alert us that we should go ahead and, and do more um, evaluation. Um, the medical assistant, um, of course, during the rooming process can collect information about, say, someone pre presenting with a memory complaint, uh, getting more, some of that history. So again, this part being the history taking and then documenting in the chart. Um, and then letting you know, even before you step into the, into the clinic, into the um, office, I mean, um, letting you know what their findings have been so far. And then, of course, uh, even, uh, even before the patient walks into the room, when they're waiting to be called in, they have the, um, the questionnaires that we give them at the front desk. So a common questionnaire we give our patients is a Medi-Cal staying healthy assessment tool for seniors. And there's a specific question, which is question 20, where it, where it asks about any concern, subjective concerns about memory issues. So step two is then administering the actual cognitive and functional screening tools. And um, this, this table here on the, on the left kind of summarizes the different tools that are presented in the, in the um, training module. Um, so the tools can, can either be done using the patient themselves or an informant um, for both the cognitive tool or, and the functional tool. Um, I wanted to point out that the time, that the estimated time for each tool, and so you have an idea of how much time you would need, especially in the primary care setting, how much time you think you would have to spend on each of these tools. So a lot of these can be done within five minutes. So that's why um, in our clinic, we use our med we ask our medical assistants to help us during the intake form, the intake time to do that for us. Um, so, and a lot of these uh, tools can actually be given as surveys. So a lot of can be as screening tools that you can give as printed out surveys to the patient that they can fill out even before they walk into the clinic. So you already have the information before you even start the encounter. Um, so I wanted to provide some examples again. So the front desk, can provide these screening tools um, as questionnaires as soon as they sign in. Um, MAs can be trained to administer these screening tools during the rooming process and document the results and even let you know of their findings so you can really focus on that during your encounter. Um, and the, a social worker or behavioral health clinician can also administer these screening tools with patients or the informant 
or even call, say you have a patient that comes in um, and that you're concerned about memory issues, but they don't, they, they don't want to talk about it. You can always follow up and speak with the informant or a family member or the caregiver, or maybe a surrogate, de um, surrogate medical decision maker and ask questions um, in a form of, of questions over the phone with the help of a social worker or a behavioral health clinician. So these again are just examples. There's many ways you can go about getting different team members to collect this part of the CHA. The third step is establishing and documenting uh, patient support. Um, so this, again, this information can be gathered by any team member using the following questions, and these questions are as part of the training module. Um, so the first question being, do you have a healthcare agent, someone you have designated to make healthcare decisions for you if you can't speak for yourself? Um, the other question would be, do you have someone, a family member, friend, or social worker who helps you with tasks or coordinating your medical care? So again, this can be these questions can be administered by any any of your team members from the front desk um, to the MA social worker. So some examples again, front desk can, for example, when they check in, they can verify who is that person's um, surrogate um, in the chart. So a lot of our our electro, electronic medical records have um, easy steps to find where they have an uploaded advanced care directive uh, or an emergency contact or comments showing where the patient has designated who their, their surrogate medical decision maker would be. So it'd be a, a good, good practice for the front desk to check on that regularly. So if there's any changes, they are able to change that. Um, same with the MAs during rooming and discharging, they can also gather this information and document. Um, and the social worker or nursing staff can also call patients before or after an appointment and gather this information, sort of similar to what I do with my clinic and my RN. Um, patients can also be reminded via email and go over go through their web portal and update their healthcare surrogate. So a lot of our patients in our in our clinic like to use um, the the patient portal and communicate with me that way. So and a lot of them are pretty good about knowing how to work the system or they have a loved one or a family member who are really good with computers and with technology and they're able to submit that information on behalf of the patient. So that's another way to engage the patient in, in this really important conversation about establishing and documenting patient support. Um, and then once you've, you've say you had a patient and you've um, diagnosed cognitive impairment, um, the next step is starting the, the brain health plan. And this is critical for patients who, who you have found to have cognitive impairment. And they include these three different elements, um, one being making sure that we're addressing any sensory deficits, specifically vision and hearing, uh, making sure that that's being screened for, if there's any abnormalities that they're being uh, referred to the right specialist to, take, to address that. Other being reviewing medications, so having a pharmacy team go over medications and making sure the medications, um, there's a, a correct reason for them, or if they're not, they shouldn't be on them or the right dosing. So that's incredibly important, especially in our older patients and even more especially in our patients who have cognitive impairment because there's a lot of medications that we can identify that can cause uh, cognitive impairment or contribute to it. Um, the third element being uh, connecting patients with activities that they can do to stay physically healthy. So exercises, socialization in the community, things that would keep their brain healthy. So um, a lot of times we rely on our social workers or care navigators to really connect our patients with what's available in the community. Um, so having these three elements, at least addressing them already starting at, at that time that you diagnose them with cognitive impairment is very important. And, and I would expand that this can be done for really any patient, especially older patients. So you don't necessarily have to have cognitive impairment to start this conversation, but this is vital for those with cognitive impairment. So I'm going to go through some cases here. So we'll start with Mr. Smith. Um, Mr. Smith is an 85-year-old male with insulin-dependent type 2 diabetes, hypertension, atrial fibrillation, and macular degeneration, who was recently seen in the emergency department after a fall at home. He is greeted by the front desk staff on arrival who provide him a questionnaire with questions about his ADLs and IDLs and a flyer about advanced care planning. On his chart, his chief complaint is 
ED follow-up after fall at home. While he's waiting, he completes the questionnaire. The MA calls Mr. Smith's name and starts rooming the patient. During the MA's intake, it is noticed that Mr. Smith is repeating questions and cannot recall his medications. She asks patient about his memory and he reports no issues. The MA administers the MIDI-COG, score comes at back as two out of five. The MA collects information or the questionnaire um, with the ADLs and the IEDLs and notices that the patient has, has answered the questions as independent with all ADLs and IEDLs. The MA finishes rooming the patient and comes to your desk to present her findings to you. So I'm gonna pause at here just to highlight a few things, um, especially the, the, the things in bold um, specifically. So in the third bullet point, um, so at this point, the MA is already noticing, this MA has been trained for, um, for the cognitive health assessment um, and she knows when to start screening patients. So she's been trained to look for signs so even as soon as the patient reports, or he's already, he's already um, exhibiting issues with cognitive impairment because he's repeating questions, he's not able to recall medications, she, she already starts doing the, the CHA um, and she administers the mini-cog herself. Um, and then she already has the information of, the, of his function with the questionnaire that was provided to him earlier that earlier um, before the visit started. So at this point, you already have at least two of your of, of the parts of your CHA that you need. So already have a lot of information even before you walk into the room to see the patient as a, the clinician. So you go in and see the clinician, you see the, your patient. Um, Mr. Smith is telling you that he feels fine. Um, he can't fully recall the circumstances of the fall yesterday. And you ask Mr. Smith, who he relies on if he needs support. And he says that his daughter, Carol, is there for him if he needs something and he sees her often. You plan on calling Carol to get more history of the fall and any collateral information about his cognitive status. By the end of the visit, you have collected all three parts of the CHA and determined that Mr. Smith has a positive CHA and requires a follow-up visit, which you schedule. You start the brain health plan by screening for vision and hearing while he is in the clinic. His visual acuity is noted to be abnormal and you offer him an optometrist, or you refer him to an optometrist, excuse me. So I'm gonna pause here, um, looking at, again at focusing on the, the bolded areas. So you walk in already having a lot of information before you start the encounter and you ask him, about his surrogate, his surrogate medical decision maker. So already that's another element of the CHA that's been that's been collected. So by the time you're done with this encounter, you've already collected information from the history. You've already collected information about cognitive status and functional status, and you've already collected information about um, surrogate medical decision making, who that person, who the support people are in his in this patient's life, and you're able to make the diagnosis before he finish before he leaves the clinic and are able to start the brain health plan. Um, an important part though, before Mr. Smith leaves, if you, you have to disclose, of course, the, the findings. So the findings of the cognitive health, the, the, the cognitive health assessment and um, document that you've had the conversation with Mr. Smith um, or his um, surrogate medical decision maker. So this is an example of how you can disclose to Mr. Smith your findings. Thank you for taking the time with me and my team today to review your fall and brain health. When we did that brief test on your memory, you had some difficulty. In the survey about how you are managing your day-to-day -day activities, it seems that you are managing fine. My plan next is to schedule a follow-up visit and to talk to Carol about how you are doing to be sure I'm doing all I can to support your brain health. Today, there are things we can do. Importantly, we should make sure your vision is checked more thoroughly, and I've referred you to the optometrist. And I appreciate that you have also given me information about how Carol supports you, and I have made sure her contact information is in the chart. So we're going to go through a second case, uh, Mr. Gomez. So Mr. Gomez is a 67-year-old male with type 2 diabetes complicated by diabetic ulcers resulting in right below the knee amputation 
ESRD on hemodialysis, history of the subdural hemorrhage and strokes with residual left-sided hemiparesis, who is homebound and is scheduled to establish care with you over a video appointment today. Mr. and Mrs. Gomez are on the video call. Mrs. Gomez is Mr. Gomez's health care agent according to his chart. So already here, you, you have the information of um, the element of the CHA in terms of who is the who can be the patient's medical surrogate medical decision maker. During your visit, you ask about his memory and he denies any issues and refuses to talk to you about this topic further. Mrs. G Gomez appears uneasy by his response. With Mr. Gomez's permission, you speak with Mrs. Gomez separately. She shares with you that Mr. Gomez has not been paying their bills on time and has been making unusual purchases online. You conduct an AD8, which was positive for cognitive impairment. So I'm gonna pause here. Um, so in this case, Mr. Gomez um, does not wanna talk about his memory issues. He, and so Mrs. Gomez, the, the surrogate medical decision maker is the one that's presenting with concern about his memory. So in this case, um, you're getting history from the informant, which is Mrs. Gomez, and then you're also conducting the um, the cognitive tool with the informant, so it would be the AD8, and he screens positive for cognitive impairment. While you're speaking with Mr. Gomez, um, you ask your RN, who helps you with your CHA, to conduct the functional assessment with the ADLs and the IADLs. His functional assessment suggests he needs help with all IADLs and some ADLs including transferring, dressing, and bathing. So he tested positive for a functional, um, functional issues, functional impairment. So pausing here, um, in this case, for the, for, for the first, the beginning of this case, most of the, the information has been collected by the clinician directly, but here you can use your interprofessional team member, including a nursing, a, a nurse staff, to help you collect some information while you're, you're doing other parts of the encounter. So in this case, the RN who works closely with this clinician is able to collect some of the functional assessment while the clinician's talking to either the patient or the informant. So by the end of the visit, you have all three parts of the CHA and you determine that Mr. Gomez has tested positive for, for uh, cognitive of issues and you require that he, you ask that he follows up with you for further assessment. So he's been screened as positive for cognitive health um, impairment. So in this case, I'm gonna go over um, how example of charting. So what's important for you to document as you're collecting all this information using your interprofessional team. So in your note, um, you should collect the history. Um, so your the wife who was the informant in this case is the one reporting concerns about memory, um, specifically for getting to pay bills, behavioral changes. So with the different online activity, so you you should you should uh, document that of course the history which is really important. Um, then the tools that are being used for the the cognitive um, health, the cognitive screening the functional screening. So for the cognitive screening, um, since the patient didn't really want to talk about it, you you speak with the informant and the informant you're able to do the eighty eight, um, and he scores abnormally on that. And then you do the func functional tool and that's found to be abnormal as well. And then you also have um, documentation of the patient's surrogate medical decision maker, who in this case is Mrs. Gomez's wife. Um, so your interpretation at this point would be a positive screen for cognitive impairment or dementia. And th this result is disclosed to the patient and his wife, and you plan for follow-up appointment to continue a more in-depth assessment. So I just wanted to um, remind everyone about the criteria for billing for CHA. Um, so in order to be to bill with the building code uh, 1494F, the the clinician or, or, or the, the person who's, who's, who's um, doing the CHA, the cognitive health assessment, must have done, done the core training. Um, the patient must be Medi-Cal only. They have to be at least 65 years or older. And in terms of documentation, they have to have at least the cognitive tool used documented as, as well as the results and um, documentation that the results have been um, disclosed to the, the patient and or um, surrogate medical decision maker. 
um, in order for, the, for you to bill. So again, the, the criteria for documentation includes the cognitive tool that you use, the results, and the fact that you disclose the information to the patient and or surrogate medical decision maker. So in this third case, we have Ms. Parker. Ms. Parker is a 91-year-old female with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, mild to moderate osteo osteoarthritis of the bilateral knees, hips, and depression. She is scheduled to see you in clinic. While she waits, she speaks with this clinic social worker regarding resources about adult day centers in the community. Uh, Ms. Parker is a widow. She lives alone in a house with two dogs. She has no children and no caregiver. She's very worried about her memory and feels like she needs to keep her brain as healthy as she can and heard that socializing is healthy for the brain. So in this, I'm gonna pause here. In this encounter, you have the social worker who's speaking with the patient about resources so she can stay socially engaged in the community and stay um, cognitively healthy. So she's being very proactive and she wants to stay um, as healthy as she can. So, so, so the social worker is already gathering this history. Um, so she, the social worker can actually document as part of the CHI steps. So the social worker obtains a history of Ms. Parker regarding her memory symptoms and conducts a GP cog. Ms. Parker's score is six, which indicates more information is needed about function. The social worker documents and reports her findings to you in clinic. You let the MA know that the patient has memory concerns. Your MA gathers information about the ADLs and IADLs while rooming the patient, which are all intact. You ask Ms. Parker about any support person or healthcare agent. She reports that she has no one at the moment. And you will reassure Ms. Parker that you will conduct this assessment again next year and encourage her to pursue brain health activities. So I'm gonna go back into and, and kind of uh, summarize a little bit about what's been going on. So focusing on the, on the bolded area. So the social worker has, got, has initially documented the, the history of the patient presenting with memory concerns. So that part, that element of CHA has been done. Um, at, this social worker has gone through the CHA training. So they know the different elements of the CHA and they, they can perform any part. So now that they have history, they go on to the next part, which is the cognitive assessment. And they do the cognitive assessment and it's borderline for this patient. The social worker then reports so far her, their findings to you and you're in clinic with them. So since you're gonna see this patient the same day, you work with your other team members, which includes your MA who's going to room the patient before you see them. And you let the MA know that, that this patient needs a functional assessment as well. So while the MA is being rooming your patient, they can do the functional assessment. And then once when they're ready to see you, you can go in and even before you start speaking with a patient, you already have the history or the history documented and you have the cognitive assessment results. So you speak with a patient, you try to get more history, and then you ask about the um, any medical surrogate uh, decision makers. And in this case, the patient has none. So at this point, you will actually hit on all three elements of the CHA. Um, and in this case, um, Ms. Parker is, is not like does not have cognitive impairment with your assessment. So you reassure her, you provide her reassurance that you'll do this again next year, and you encourage her to pursue brain health activities and talk to her about the brain health plan. So if someone, um, a patient like this, would be uh, it'd be very appropriate to talk about brain health plan and to keep her as healthy uh, as we can. So with that. Um, I kind of want to again bring it, bring the the um, the the objectives back to what we wanted to present today, which was the importance of working with your interprofessional colleagues to conduct the CHA, the cognitive health assessment. Um, so it, it'd be a good idea to discuss with your clinic how you can incorporate the CHA or the the different elements of CHA into your workflow and by using your interprofessional team. So if there's different ways um, that you can have different team members trained with this, um, this module and for them to perform different elements of CHA in a, in a pretty seamless manner. 
any team member can take the CHA training. It's, uh, it would be a good idea to engage your practice manager um, or the nursing leadership to get your interprofessional team members the necessary training to conduct the CHA. And of course, it's important to engage your staff to have readily available information about advanced care planning, community resources for dementia care and caregiver resources, healthy aging, things about exercise and, and social activities, community services, transportation, and senior centers. So this kind of this last bullet points more about the brain uh, brain health plan and um, and also uh, connecting your patient with the resources available to, available to them in the community, which is very important. So this picture here is um, a picture from my my federally qualified health center in UCI in Santa Ana, California. So this picture has our providers. So they have um, attending physicians, residency physicians. Um, we have our MAs. We have our LVNs. Um, we have our social worker in the back. So our, our, our team, uh, our primary care team at UCI, uh, the Family Health Center is um, very interprofessional. So we work with everyone very closely. And of course, like I mentioned, engaging your staff to have these important resources available to your patients, including things like Alzheimer's Orange County. They're, they're great partners in taking care of our patients once cognitive impairment, specifically dementia, is diagnosed, how to care for the patient moving forward. Um, the com community resources like councils on, uh, on aging are really important. Um, they can connect our patients with very important services such as Meals on Wheels. So, so with that, um, I'm going to um, end my presentation. Um, but again, thank you for having me today to present on this really important topic that um, I'm very, um, I, I find very interesting and very important and, and just a very exciting topic as well. I think working in the interprofessional uh, manner is, is vital to take care of our patients and provide the best quality of care we can. So thank you. Um, I'm here uh, along with Dr. Chodos if you have any questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dayambuha. And I think we have um, a lot of great comments in the chat and we actually have, I think, adequate time to address a lot of these um, comments and questions. And we have some hands raised. I wanna let you know that I see those. I'm gonna first just quickly go through some of our most common questions. Do you mind actually like reversing the slide so that QR code yeah. is gonna be live? Um, thank you, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, that QR code is going to be live at 1255, according to the requirements um, of our CME. But if you use the QR code, you can get CME. Um, we have uh, we have a little note about that in the chat. Um, I'll also say, because we did have some questions about the overall CHA, I put an answer in the Q&A if you can see it, just to quickly review it. But if you go to DementiaCareWare.org, that is the primary online training that you can access through our website. And as I mentioned before, it's sort of the foundation of what we're talking about. And I think you can globally think of it as an approach you can use to quickly screen your older patients to see if there's a cognitive and functional concern that really brings it to the level that you should be doing a follow-up to see if there's you know, ultimately enough evidence to suggest they have a meaningful cognitive impairment that would be like mild cognitive impairment or dementia. We also really start off in that training talking about all the things you can do right out of the gate for any older person. But again, we really emphasize people with symptoms to help support their brain health in a way that might even really modify the symptoms they're having in a very meaningful way. So we want to emphasize that you can start an assessment in a brief way and start a brain health plan right away too. Um, so our training goes over all of that and it's a really broad group that can get continuing education credits. And we really hope that's useful to people that'll be available for the next year and a half. So we really want people to take advantage of that as well. Um, and um, Rita, I don't know if you're able to put in the chat all of the different disciplines that can get credit through that, that training module. Um, what I thought you did such a great job is just to talk about all these kinds of different examples of where different team members come in, but we got equally great questions about it and great comments. So one um, comment uh, early on was about training, one question. I wonder if you have any additional thoughts. Um, one thing that I thought to add 
um, to, to sort of the discussion here is when you think about perhaps asking a medical assistant or a nurse in the clinic to do this and they weren't doing it before, of course you wanna, um, especially if it's around the cognitive assessment tools and not just a survey they're handing over. If they're administering it, I guess you wanna make sure there's a certain level of quality that and adherence to you know the the standard for administering that test. Um, I know in prior trainings that I've done, what we often do is you know spend time going over it, and then we do some practice sessions. And then I think the next way to really enforce enforce is a strong word um, reassure you know that you're you have good quality and good fidelity to how you're supposed to be using that tool. Would be to have you know some ob observations in real in real time with patients by someone who really knows the test and can observe somebody and give them feedback and kind of sign off. Okay, now they can do the mini cog with patients. Maybe after being observed a few times. I don't know if you've had any experience with with that, like training and kind of ensuring that people are able to administer these tests with fidelity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Um, um... I think a lot of the, the MAs are pretty comfortable doing them and, and they've done them for quite some time. But if there's like a new, uh, an MA who just had the training and you want to make sure that they're doing it, uh, the things like the mini cog or the GP cog appropriately, I think having sessions like where you can kind of reverse shadow um, and see how they're doing it. I think that's probably very appropriate to, at least until you feel like the, the, the MA knows what, of course, what they're doing. So I think for quality, um, for just for to make sure the the quality of the cognitive tools being done well, um, maybe doing some reverse shadowing just to make sure that's that they're doing it correctly. Awesome. Um, I think the other the other point that is really well taken is like when we think about the team, the way we defined it for this conversation is really people who are working within the setting of a primary care clinic and you know, part in some ways of that formal team, I tend to think of the patient and the care partner also as part of that mm -hmm. team, because you're potentially giving them some work to do and to help get some of the information to fill out the cognitive health assessment. Um, and then one of our respondents here said, or participants said, you know, also think about community members, case managers, care specialists, um, people who have been working through how MediConnect and, and other ways sort of can contribute to this. And there's definitely examples across the country, if not also in, here in California, of where social service providers, case managers, and, and other folks will do the assessment and have that you know, proactive communication with a care provider. Um, so I wanted to be sure to highlight that point because it's a really good one. And some of us may be in a community where that's actually possible. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the, the other thing I I wanted to quickly address as well, because people, um, before I, I lob some questions at you, um, is people are asking about billing. And so what we pointed out is that this particular cognitive health assessment and the way we outlined the needs for documentation and billing are meant to be um, accessible to Medi-Cal adult Medi-Cal beneficiaries who are 65 and older and don't have Medicare because they're left out of the, the annual wellness visit and other ways to code for and you know get reimbursed for your time doing cognitive assessments. However, there's nothing about the cognitive health assessment, which I would again emphasize is really structuring an approach to briefly getting the information you're going to need to to continue to understand if that person has um, you know, cognitive impairment that's meaningfully affecting their life and may even be dementia. Um, you know, you have other mechanisms for the Medicare patient. So, but this approach could be used on anyone over 65, could also very well be used on somebody who's younger. But this particular billing code that we highlight in our slides is going to be only usable for people who are Medi-Cal only 65 and older. And the additional the additional requirement is that the provider documenting and billing has done our training and is registered with us. And we are exploring different ways to make sure people can get signed off on the training. Like if we do a, a webinar with you or an in-person training, can we ensure that um, you get credit for that as well if, you've, if we've gone over the content? 
So I really look forward to having more opportunities for people to get signed off on the training. Um, but the short answer is we, this particular billing opportunity is for Medi-Cal 65 and older for the most part, um, Medi-Cal only. Um, and then for FQHCs, it largely does not increase their revenue, um, but uh, we hope is still, you know, highly valuable to helping assess the older adult population. Um, and then we had some other great questions that, um, uh, wondering if if you want to take this one. So, mm -hmm. how often do you find that patients and caregivers caregivers are reluctant to participate in cognitive screening? And what other approaches can be used to establish trust and a safe environment for the discussion of brain health for those who may be reluctant or afraid that their independence is being threatened? Yeah, um, I think for the most part, um, I think most most patients and family members are are comfortable with having those discussions. Of course, you have patients that are worried about um, taking like, taking away their driving privileges or um, you know having a lot of their independence taken away from them. So I usually like to have a very um, honest discussion with them about what their concerns are and, and reassure them, reassure the patient. So I, I really try to be honest and as comforting as I can. Um, I don't want to, I don't obviously don't ever push doing a cognitive health assessment on someone who's not ready to do it, but um, kind of highlight on things like um, safety, uh, safety for themselves and for others. Um, and um, trying to highlight my concerns for their health and, and for the health of their caregivers. Um, because once you, you diagnose someone with cognitive impairment, you have to take care of the caregiver as well. So I try to be um, honest and, and as um, empathetic as I can and um, kind of let the patient make them as, feel as comfortable as they can. If they don't want to do it that day, it's okay, we can do it next time. I, of course, I want to uh, push on anyone, uh, push the patient to do something they don't want to do, you know, but make sure they they feel comfortable and they have the time and space to ask questions and to um, express their concerns and the reason why they don't want to do the cognitive health assessment. Yeah, and I think we'd be definitely really open to anybody who, who wants to add to that conversation. Um, I think probably the best way is to add a comment in the Q&A um, and then there are, I really appreciate that. Yeah. I think kind of the, a lot of, there is so much stigma around it, right. And so much fear, it makes a lot of sense. I think it's very rational that people are scared in a lot of ways because of this threat to their independence, this threat that stuff is going to get taken away mm -hmm. if something's discovered. Um, so I often personally find it a good sign when people are somewhat resistant in that I feel like they're being a good in some ways, good advocate for themselves, um, and, and, you know, have that self-protection in mind, mm -hmm. but, you know, I think there's a lot of talk of trying to normalize it and point out that brain health is as important as heart health, that there is a lot we can do to ensure that more independence isn't lost, right? Not ignore things so that accidents are happening or financial safety is at risk. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, I, I really appreciate your framing and also just the the nice thing about primary care being that longitudinal relationship and we can kind of approach it again at a later time um, if, if someone's not ready. Um, yes, yeah, so oh, Dr. Uh, Meredith in the Q&A also says we can highlight the resources we can offer for those we do screen as opposed to just focusing on a health goal or focusing on, you know, some... Um, you know, clinical goal. Um, one, um, so two questions here that are really important about kind of the importance of this issue. So one question, what's the percent of our senior population in Orange County or in the U.S. diagnosed with Alzheimer's and dementia? And is the percent increasing rapidly? Another question that's somewhat related is what's the rate of positive screening in the population of interest what share of those positive screens turn out not to be cognitive impairment? I don't know if either of those, the reason I see those as related is, you know, as the importance of this issue grows, how many screens are we actually doing and what are we actually finding, I think becomes really relevant. Um, just want to see if you have any thoughts on those. 
Um, on the specific percentages, I don't know the statistics for the most the most updated statistics. So I don't want to I don't want to give the wrong information. Um, I think you know in in the research I've done. Uh, in terms of working in, a, in, the, in the interprofessional team and trying to capture more cognitive impairment, I think there's a lot, of, a big uh, percentage of patients are going undiagnosed. Um, I, I I forget the percentage I came across, so I apologize. But it, I think there's a concern that a lot of a lot of um, patients out there who do have cognitive impairment are being are not being screened. So this is why this is so important. Um, and so I can't, I can't give specific numbers, so I apologize. I don't have those numbers, that information with me. But there is a lot of research showing that there we need more people to do cognitive health assessments because there are a lot of people out there who are not being screened earlier and not being, the, the brain health plan isn't being implemented earlier when it's so important. And then the patients um, need that longitudinal care as, as the cognitive impairments progresses for whatever ideology it is. Um, so there's that, that worry that a lot of patients present in advanced stages where they could have been plugged in with resources much earlier. Yeah, I, I agree. It, we What we know, right, is it it is rapidly increasing because very, very tied to the aging of California and the population in general. Um, I believe it's something like you know, roughly going to double by 2050. Um, and we're going from like, you know, six to 7 million to 12 to 13 million, I believe in the U S. Um, it's such a good question about orange County, because the other thing we know is that people from minoritized backgrounds are higher, more, more likely to have dementia, but less likely to receive a diagnosis in a timely way. Um, if at all. So the ballpark there is roughly two times the risk of developing dementia for people who are um, identified as Black or African American, and then one and a half times for people identify as Latinx. So I think a lot about that for California, and we, you know, we know Southern California definitely has the bulk of the the population in California. So, um, but a great question about sort of these regional differences um, that would love to, I think we would, we would do ourselves a service to get more up to date on that. So thank you for that great question. Yes. I also always think of primary care, the number that, that bounces around in my head is 50% of people don't have any indication in the chart that they have dementia uh, when they do indeed have the condition. So it's being missed a lot um, in terms of the screens. We are just getting off the ground, of course, with this cognitive health assessment as a tool for folks. So we don't know what the implication is um, for how great it is at detecting or ultimately helping arrive at a diagnosis. But it's a really good point that I think you're making inherently as some of the other comments are showing in the chat that while this is a this is a first step at noticing something is going on with a cognitive symptom or functional decline basically. And not all of those things are gonna be dementia. So there's clearly gonna be a need for next steps and a thorough evaluation that helps determine what else might be going on, like medication side effects, depression, substance use disorders, um, results of a head injury, um, and you know a million other uh, other things that we need to be really um, thoughtful about and thorough. So I think they're both really good questions, and in general, um, I think it is a great question about how effective is screening. I think what we do know, though, is detection is advantageous in terms of health, quality of life, being able to plan for the future, being able to avoid catastrophes um, for, for people who do ultimately end up um, living with dementia. So I think really we do want to be able to detect at an earlier stage to have that time to support people and really improve quality of life as well as prevent you know, unwanted outcomes. Um, we um, are at 1255. So do you mind Kat advancing to the CME slides yes. of people? I really appreciate that. Um, and in just a couple of minutes, we'll also have a poll that pops up that we'd really appreciate if you respond to. It helps us know how you heard about the webinar because we would like to continue to spread the word really broadly about our future webinars and make sure to reach more people. Um, thank you so much for doing that.
Um, let's see the other. Um, oh, actually, I think uh, this would be a great question um, for you, mm -hmm. uh, Kat, which is, do you have do you think doing the advanced care directive and the cognitive health assessment in the same visit gives the wrong impression? Um, I, I think for the, the way I approach the advanced, that's a great question. I think um, the way I approach the advanced care directive, I try to normalize it for, I actually do it a lot in my own, like my younger patients. Um, so I try to introduce it because um, anytime you, regardless if you, if, just, if you just did the cognitive health assessment or not, a lot of older patients get concerned when you talk about end of life planning um, so they get really suspicious, like, why are you talking about this right now? So I try to normalize it as much as I can. And I, I let them know that, you know, really anyone over the age of 18 should have one. Um, you know, life is unpredictable. You, you can't, you can't know what could happen in, in accidents happen all the time, unfortunately. Um, and it's always important in, in, the, in those scenarios to have someone in mind who knows who you are, knows your wishes, knows your values, um, what you would want in those cases where you couldn't, when you couldn't communicate for yourself or you couldn't speak on, on your by your on your own. So I try to normalize it as much as I can and try to use that language. Um, I think the timing of doing the cognitive health assessment and then the advanced care planning, I can see why that would be uh, that would present a little a little strangely for a patient. They'd be concerned. Um, but I think it just depends on the language that you use and really introducing it in a more normal normalized fashion that's not just for patients who are 65 or older, but really for really any adult should have one. Um, um, and just using that language, I think helps a lot. Um, so yeah, that's the way I approach it. I try to make it more of a something that should be talked about really when you're younger too. Um, you just never know. Um, things happen all the time, unfortunately. Once a yeah, that was a great example of normalizing it. I would also emphasize, I think for you know this stage, what we're really hoping people do is just document or check who's in their life, who's a support person, it may not be at the level, you know, and you may not have time to do the bigger conversation that leads to, you know, a thorough understanding of their healthcare proxy and, um, you know, starting to contextualize why you're asking so that we need to understand your values and that your surrogate knows those things. Um, so what we're really hoping that people start to embed is an assessment of cognition, an assessment of function, an assessment of support system, because as you go along with that patient and their support network, those are the issues that you're going to have to keep coming back to if indeed they have dementia or mild cognitive impairment, which would be, you know, a preclinical stage of dementia. Um, so that's why we really want to start off just right out of the gate, already starting to understand who's in their their, who's their support system or, you know, who's providing any care if, if there is anybody. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. you could maybe lower the stakes at this stage and then, but it's a setup for that conversation later. Like, this is something I do with everybody. It's just good life planning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we kind of need to have this information and it might help you think about what you want. Um, I really appreciate those points, Kat. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We're getting to the end, and I just want to point out that thank you, everybody, for your participation. It, this was a really wonderful discussion. Um, really appreciate also your uh, answers to our poll. That helps us a lot. We Some of our participants here came to our rescue with the data and the statistics, so we'll sort of end there, which is that um, about uh, 690,000 Californians are living with um, Alzheimer's today in the state, but that will double in the next 20 years. And um, about uh, nationwide, looks like uh, samples indicate that about 10% of people over 65 have MCI or mild cognitive impairment, I'm sorry, have dementia, and 20% have mild cognitive impairment, and much, um, very much related to age and higher rates in Black and Hispanic or Latinx populations as well. So thank you participants for that. Those, yeah. that really great information. It's a great um, example of working in a team. Like yes, a exactly. team. So great. <laughs> we, did thank it. You. we did it here today. <laughs> this is great. Um, really appreciate that. And I think we have one last slide, maybe two. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, we have another webinar. Um, we all have that information on our website shortly as well. Um, really, really pleased to invite and 
feature our colleagues, Jennifer Schlesinger and Elena Soy um, to talk about doing this cognitive health assessment on the phone or video visit, which is super duper important these days. And next slide. Um, just want to make sure you know that our website is where you can find our training and our email as well. But if you go to the next um, page, our email is just dca at ucsf.edu. And we would so welcome your comments, questions, and any, any information or, or thoughts that you're having um, and any information you need from us, please contact us there. I want to thank from the bottom of my heart, Dr. Um, De Azambuha to help us here today and to share her knowledge and experience. Um, and just that was really um, an exceptional uh, presentation and dialogue today. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. I hope thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much.